Farmer Jesse here. Sorry I didn't get a video up in the last week. I spilled water on my computer, which in retrospect was maybe not the best idea. But today I'm going to talk about some trials we have going on the farm, um, some motorcycles, some sort of Fukuoka inspired stuff, some uh, perennial cover cropping, some living pathways, uh, various things. Some of it I was actually not going to show you because I was kind of embarrassed of it, but that's not really how I roll. So let's do it. Is that going to fall down? All right. Uh, first things first, if you're not subscribed to this channel, make sure to hit the subscribe button. If you are subscribed, you're awesome. And you're also going to hear today a lot of different trials. So these are kind of ongoing. Um, we're going to be able to gauge the success. You won't hear about it if you're not subscribed. So do that. Also, um, a little windy. If you appreciate our work, you can always go to patreon.com slash farmer Jesse and contribute uh, or go to Venmo and kick us a few bucks and just say, I appreciate that you all do these weird things so that we can learn about them. Yeah. Okay. On with the video. So first I wanted to get some experience with living pathways. Living pathways are pathways that are full of plants. Um, grasses, clovers, whatever makes sense for your region. Um, but they're alive. They are not cultivated. They're not mulched. They're living roots in the soil, which is always the best, right? Like you want as many living roots in the soil as possible. However, um, when most people do a living pathway, they often put mulch down, uh, plastic mulch, plastic culture. Uh, that's to keep the plants from kind of creeping into the bed space. Uh, the other thing they'll do is maybe turn it over, till it every year. Um, so they would let it creep back in over the fall, kind of have like a perennial cover crop of sorts, uh, and then till it out and plant it again in the spring, often with plastic. And we've always done some amount of living pathway, but like I said, most people use plastic and we were using a plastic liner in between the path, or which is really just the pasture, and the beds. But the big question is like, how do you do this how do you do living pathways with no plastic on the beds? Here's how we went about it. This winter, I had rye and vetch planted in these two beds. Um, then we sowed clover right down the middle and allowed that to sort of come up. And then we mowed the rye and vetch, covered it with just a little bit of compost. Um, and then we planted into that. And what we planted here is mostly okra and this side has some potatoes in it because I just can't help myself but do something weird. Anyway, largely, this has been kind of a success in some ways. Some of the okra is getting some pest damage so that makes me think that maybe not all of it is as healthy as I want it to be. Uh, but for the most part, it looks good. We're starting to get some okra off of it. And the creep hasn't been bad, but there's definitely not just clover in the pathways. Um, there's a lot of grasses coming up, and there's even a little bit of grass in the bedways. But so far, so good. Um, I can pull those weeds out of the beds. Did I say bedways a second ago? We're going to have a conversation about this on the podcast this week. I had Ginny Love on from uh, Love and Fresh Flowers, and she talks about her living pathways um, and some of the ways that she manages it. And just a few other notes on living pathways. Keeps the soil in place. Living roots means microbes and nutrients are brought to the surface so your crop can access them. It's cool. I think there's some potential here. I think with maybe smaller crops, lettuces and that sort of stuff, it would be a little bit harder. But just mowing this once a week or once every 10 days has pretty much kept it in check. I feel pretty good about it so far, so look out for updates on that. So we talked about relay cropping in a video a few weeks ago, um, and this is actually one of these relay crops that I wanted to try this year, which was maybe stupid because these are very uh, valuable crops, but I had squash here, and I cut the squash out when it was done producing after about nine weeks, um, and that was just yellow squash. Multi-pick is my, my jam. Um, so we pulled that out and underneath it, I had planted before at the same time I planted the squash, I'd planted this ginger. So the ginger's kind of coming out. And since we had this space in the middle and ginger's super slow, uh, we put some beets in there just to get one more crop out of this bed. But essentially $500 or so worth of squash, probably like another hundred dollars worth of beets could be as much as a couple thousand dollars worth of ginger to come out of the same bed in the same year. 
My impression right now is that the ginger got a little smushed by the giant squash leaves. I'm seeing a little bit of this sort of tip burn, and I don't know if that's because it was shaded by the squash leaves, and then I pulled the squash leaves off, and then we hit like 95 degrees for several days in a row, so that probably wasn't super exciting if you're a ginger plant. And I probably won't be doing this again because what I would be doing, what I want to be doing in the future is just having taller ginger, more mature at this point in its July, mid July. So I'd rather have I'd rather have more mature ginger right now than have that interplanting. But there is some interplanting potential with ginger, so that's that's kind of neat. And hey, look, there's some mushrooms. And so the ultimate idea just being the, like if you have a really long season crop, it's good to get a couple crops through before that long season crop really takes over the bed so that you're maximizing that space because this is, you know, this is our one of our tunnels and it's very expensive, very valuable space. Can you transplant sweet corn? Totally. This sweet corn looks awesome. Um, I, While I'm headed over to one other, I'll just show you this. We mowed rye and planted, transplanted sweet corn um, out of 72 wind strips and you know you don't want them to get too tall because if they get root bound they'll actually uh put up their i can show you this in a second they'll where they'll get if they get a little bit too root bound even in wind strips they will um get stressed and they'll actually start flowering a little bit earlier than you want them to um but no the corn looks great Boop. this is one we're doing that i am kind of excited about so We've discovered over the years that sweet potatoes do best when they're on in rows, when they don't have any sweet potatoes growing to this side of them. So to one side of them, they do 20% better yield. So we were like, how do we make every sweet potato bed that? So what we did here is we put sweet potatoes here and here and then a different crop here. So basically these sweet potatoes don't have sweet potatoes on that side. These sweet potatoes don't have sweet potatoes on this side. And it's like that all the way through. So this is dent corn um, and peanuts right there, which are not doing very well in the shade of the dent corn. That was a mistake. But then sweet potatoes, sweet potatoes, dent corn, sweet potatoes, sweet potatoes, dent corn, and then sweet potatoes. Yeah, and so my hope there is just to just get 20, that 20% 20 extra yield. Instead of getting 200 pounds off of a 100 foot bed, we want to get 220. So that's my goal here is to have, get 220 off every single row. Um, we'll see. I wanna talk about some summer cover crop trialing stuff. Um, this is a bunch of different stuff. It's sesbania and mung beans and buckwheat and Sudan grass and millet. It's just so many different things. Um, but this is gonna be our fall brassicas, which will go in in about three weeks. And basically, I've been treating this really well, like trying to make this the most healthy cover crop we can, uh, because this spot has been really deficient. In fact, you can kind of see how this level right here is like kind of a darker green than this level, and it's a little bit taller. For whatever reason, this spot has been kind of funky, and um, I think it's a little bit compacted, but. Anyway, been spraying that with compost teas. We even mowed it really high to kind of imitate grazing. So I basically just stood on the BCS so that the flail mower was kind of in the air and that's super safe. Don't do that at home. Anyway, mowed it really high to kind of imitate grazing so that it would put some energy into its roots and kind of build a, a slightly larger root system. Yeah, so that's gonna be fall brassicas right there. All right, so this is some some weirder ones. Been a big fan of Fukuoka. I love the idea of doing absolutely as little as you possibly can to make a really healthy crop. Um, so I had this idea of basically sowing this to a cover crop. So like lots of different stuff, rye and clover and uh, there's like grasses. There's a bunch of different stuff in here and mowing it really tight and then drilling with our seed drill or our transplant drill, which I did that video about and putting our winter squash in here. So that's what I did. I drilled holes and mowed it, drilled holes and transplanted winter squash. And it has mostly gone okay. <laughs> um, some of these are doing better than others, but like I'm not seeing a ton of damage. They did go through a two week drought, so that's why they're kind of small. But the idea here being just essentially 
I want, I want to make it super easy so that I could just mow a plot and plant something. And I want to see how viable that is. I don't have irrigation out here, so this is all dry farmed. Um, but there's no, there's not much pest damage. They yellowed really bad at first. Uh, they were not happy just going into kind of raw ground. But then they recovered, and I haven't seen any squash bugs or cucumber beetles. Um, they seem prime. They seem mostly happy. So I'll definitely have to update you on how this goes. But I love this potential of just doing absolutely as little as you can. Hey, ding dong, out. So I'll have to update you on how this goes, but I, I love this potential of just doing absolutely the bare amount that you have to. It bit me really bad once this year, which is the last thing I'll talk about. I think it's the last thing. Um, the potatoes that we trialed. Um, there are potatoes in here. You just can't see them for all the weeds. Um, and they've been devoured by potato beetles. This, this is arguably like the failure of the year. Essentially what I wanted to do was um, mow like this, lay my potatoes down, put a thick thing of straw or hay over top of it, um, and then just let them grow. So they didn't go onto bare soil, which I think was a mistake. I was thinking since they were slow crop, they could take enough time to, you know, maybe the soil would work. Uh, I don't know what I was thinking. I really don't. Um, it was not successful. This was an unsuccessful way to grow potatoes. Um, I don't recommend it. I've also tried doing the same thing with compost, which was also largely unsuccessful. It was a little bit more successful than this, um, where I just kind of put them on a bare surface and then covered it with compost. We still had a lot of potato beetle issues. I'm still trying to figure out how to do, you know, commercial scale no-till potatoes. Um, if you have any advice for that or anything that's worked for you, let me know. Uh, this was not it. Anyway, that's it for now, I think. Like this video if you like this video. Make sure to subscribe to the channel. Um, other stuff, share it. That seems like a good idea. Anyway, we'll talk to you all later. Bye. I see you too.